You're watching PMA Perspective, a statewide source for business, government, and policy news. Bringing you newsmaker interviews with Carl Marrera, the final word with Mr. Fred Anton, and from our studios in Harrisburg, here is your host, David Taylor. Welcome to PMA Perspective, your weekly half-hour news program on Pennsylvania business, government, and politics. I'm your host, David Taylor, president of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Pennsylvania's public pension crisis isn't only at the state government level. Many local governments are also struggling with obligations that are outstripping taxpayers' ability to pay. Later in the program, I'll discuss possible solutions with Senate Finance Chairman John Eichelberger. But first, PMA's Carl Moreira interviewed Rick Shuttler of the Pennsylvania Municipal League to understand the scope of this challenge. Rick Shuttler, Executive Director with the Pennsylvania Municipal League, thank you so much for joining us on PMA Perspective. Thanks for having me, Carl. So you guys are one of the, the leads, or if not the lead, uh, for the Fix the Numbers campaign, which viewers might have seen on billboards or on social media or even on a subway or a bus. Tell us a little bit about the project you're working on there. Well, I hope they've seen it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, Fix the Numbers is sort of our communication arm of our legislative campaign to try to uh, reform municipal pensions and Act 111, which is binding the arb binding arbitration law for public safety personnel in Pennsylvania. We created Fix the Numbers. Well, and you guys produced a wonderful piece uh, that kind of sets up what the, all the problems are that some municipalities, cities are, are having here in Pennsylvania. So let's take a look at that now. Fifty years ago, our valued public safety employees made less per hour than private sector workers. To balance the lower pay, they were given excellent pensions and other employee protections, all paid for by the people. Decades went by. The economy went like this. But public safety pay kept going up, with pay and pensions exceeding the private sector, forcing municipalities to dig deeper, raising taxes, pulling money from roads and parks, and going deeper into debt. Today, many public safety pensions and other benefits are unsustainable. Expenses are exceeding revenue. It doesn't work. Soon there will be no money for anything, not even pensions. Three bills in the Pennsylvania General Assembly would make things fair again giving our fire and police personnel a good retirement package, more along the lines of what most other folks get, not one that weighs down our neighborhoods and jeopardizes our future. It's not politics, it's not propaganda, it's pure math, and it doesn't work anymore. Contact your state legislator and ask for a yes vote on House Bill 316, Senate Bill 755, and Senate Bill 211. It's time to fix the numbers. So coming away from, from all of that, those numbers and information, it's a math equation, but, but tell us a little bit more about some of the information behind some of these important numbers. Sure. Well, we have, we, we've, our membership has come to us and said, look, we have this huge pension issue. We've tried to control it. We've tried to do things, but it's really creating a, a real burden within our general funds, the amount of dollars we have to put into it. So we took a look at it. As of right now, there are 300 plus municipalities in Pennsylvania whose pension funds are below 80% funded. In the private sector, that would be really be a crisis and be significant. We think it is too, but it doesn't, it doesn't get the same sense of urgency. But we need to correct it because a lot of those numbers are getting larger mm -hmm. and larger and creating a bigger chunk, of, taking a bigger chunk of folks' general funds. And it affects, the, it affects other services in those communities and their ability to provide yeah, those services. Yeah, what are some of those other services that are, it really cuts into? Well, if you look at fixed numbers, you'll see things about playgrounds. Why can't my mm -hmm. community uh, afford to fix a playground? Mm -hmm. If we want these communities to grow, we have to provide those quality of life services that folks want and want, and want to live in a place that has those. And so we see, we see public works departments being decimated. We, 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 they can't fix roads well enough because mm -hmm. you just don't have the personnel anymore because they're affected by these costs, these pension costs, which are mandatory to pay. Right. And, and if you can't afford to do so, where do you go? You look at other services to cut. So you see in the papers, um, Scranton is obviously uh, one city that is really having a, a lot of problems. Um, other cities like Reading, um, Philadelphia, but this is not 
necessarily um, limited to just cities. Can you talk a little bit about how this is a holistic problem across all communities in Pennsylvania? Sure. There are 56 cities in Pennsylvania. The, what I just quoted to you was there are over 300 communities whose pension plans are less than 80% funded. So there's 200 plus somewhere yeah. that are not cities that also have this problem. Mm -hmm. And more and more that are, that are going to have the problem in the future. And I think it's around services. If you are a full service municipality, meaning that you have a police force, many, in many cases perhaps a career fire department, these costs are going to affect you in a negative way in the future. It's simply how we've done it at the local level and how pensions are are constructed, I think, is what the issue is. What about is. regionally? Uh, is this limited um, to the southeastern portion of the state, the southwestern portion of the state? How, how does it look regionally? We've not seen um, a, a trend that way. I think one. I think when you look at the northern tier, only because there's not as many population centers and full-service municipalities, you may not see as much. But other than that, it's dispersed pretty evenly. Even in the southeast, where you have affluent communities, they many of them are putting significant dollars into their pension plan out of their general funds that are going to affect those other services as time goes on. So how do we get here? Well, I think we got here because we have we have two things. One is we have Act 111 which is binding arbitration for public safety personnel. Uh, the other general recently said, and when he was, he's been doing a lot of work in this area, a lot of good work, I believe. He said, we could not believe the, the benefits uh, across the state, how they were all different. There's two statutes that control municipal pensions, Act 600 and the Third Class City Code, yet we have every, all these municipalities with different benefit levels. Mm -hmm. So we've created kind of a chaos within the system that way, and I attribute a lot of that to Act 111, which a neutral arbitrator makes an award and can really award any pension benefit that they want as long as it's legal, but we've seen that morphed and morphed and morphed over the years. So we have a legislator later on the program that David Taylor is going to interview, Senator Eichelberger, who has what we hope might be a solution for some cities. But what are the things that need to get done to make sure this, this issue ends, ends today? We think we need structural benefit reform. Uh, and we also, th we also, all of our uh, legislative proposals start with new hires. It's a prospective plan. Mm -hmm. We don't affect the existing folks. So I think Senator Eichelberger is one who gets it and understands that, and he, he has uh, promoted that as we take new hires into a new system, still, still managed at the local level, but what we'll create over time is that there'll be one set of benefits for a municipal police officer in Pennsylvania, no matter what community you're in. So we hear a lot about the state pension crisis, but this is different. This is the municipal pension crisis, which is a distinct difference. What is so important? I mean, we know from the state perspective that state budgets and state taxes and all those types of things affect the state budgets, but why are municipal pensions uniquely important? Well, that's a great question, Carl. Well, we've had a real problem differentiating from the state issue, but it really is an issue. We formed a coalition for sustainable communities a number of years ago with chambers from across the Commonwealth because those chambers recognized that Act 111 and pensions were causing such fiscal strife in their home communities, in the, in the uh, core communities of their regions, that it was affecting services and also affecting businesses in the region adversely. Um, as, as If you have a core community that isn't functioning well, can't provide levels of service that are required for growth, it's a problem. It's a problem for business, and businesses are adversely affected by that, not only just with taxes, but I think just with the general perception of the business climate in the community. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and discussing this topic with us today. Where can people go to learn more about the Pennsylvania Municipal League, the Fix the Numbers campaign, and to learn more about, about you? www.pamunicipalleague.org. You'll see links out to uh, fix the numbers, and you'll find a whole bunch of other information about us and about local government in Pennsylvania. Well, Rick, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it, and thanks for being on PMA Perspective. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Carl, for that report. To further discuss this important issue, I'm pleased to welcome to the studio my guest, Senate Finance Chairman John Eichelberger. Senator, thank you for being on the program. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, I wanted the, the, the viewers to get a better understanding of what's happening with the, the municipal public pension situation. I think that there's been a fair amount of media attention and discussion about the state level public pensions, um, the SIRS and PSIRS and the $53 billion unfunded liability. Um, and that, of course, is an urgent concern. But, but in addition to that, there are problems all across the Commonwealth. Can you describe that? 
Yeah, we have, uh, we have more municipal pension programs in Pennsylvania than any other state. In fact, we have 25% of the entire country's municipal pension programs here in Pennsylvania. Goodness. And many of them are uh, underfunded. Um, we have um, one municipality that is just 10% funded, uh, 17, uh, some very low figures of, um, of fund balances in, in a lot of these municipal plans. And our municipal plans are extremely expensive to administer. A, a typical uh, municipality like a, a third-class city would have three separate plans because by law. Okay. They have to have one for their firefighters, one for their uh, police, and then a separate one for non-uniform employees. Okay. So they have three sets of administrative fees. It's just very cumbersome for them. Um, they're defined benefit programs uh, for the public safety officials there are officers so the, the firefighters and the uh, police are in a defined benefit program that is defined in state law they can't deviate from that and um, the the trend is now which isn't a surprise since we've seen this at the state level and, and happening around the country and other municipalities is that um, in the last 10 years the unfunded liability uh, in Pennsylvania for municipal plants has doubled. So um, we're very concerned about the future of that. And, and one distinction we have with the municipal plans is, with the uh, police and firefighters, is the plans have been altered because of um, arbitration rulings whenever uh, the unions are um, in, in a situation that goes to arbitration, sometimes the arbitrators will throw in a, um, a, a change in the pension program that they really shouldn't have the authority to do, mm -hmm. but they've, they've done Enriching it. Enriching the benefit, moving it up. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've never seen one where it's come, you know, it's been changed in some way to, to diminish it. It's always been an increase broadening it, expanding it to maybe uh, spouses or other things that, you know, whatever. Whatever the benefit is, it's always an expansion of the benefit, right. an improvement of the benefit for the employees. So uh, that, that also actuarially is a problem for them because when they save X number of dollars and contribute X number of dollars over a period of year and then the benefit changes, right. that was not factored into the contribution rate. So we have some special problems with municipal plans that we're, we're trying to address with new legislation. And I was going to say, can you walk us through the, the, the solutions that you're proposing? Well, my bill, and Seth Grove, Representative Seth Grove, has worked um, on, on a bill as well in the House. It's a cash balance program. Uh, my bill is a defined contribution program. Okay. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the Senate bill that we did for the, the state employees and school employees was a, a combination of cash balance and, and defined contributions, how it ended up. But what we're working on here is two separate, and these are, these are um, um, options for municipalities. It would not be required. Mm -hmm. if, if a municipality has a plan that is healthy financially and they feel that um, they want to stay with that, that, that would be acceptable. So. But I think many, many, I know many municipalities are very interested in changing to a defined contribution program. The, the way the bills would work would be, um, it would be for future employees only. There would be no change at all to, uh, to current enrollees in, in their uh, defined benefit programs. And, and defined benefit programs um, I, I are given, I think, a lot of uh, short shrift by some of the, uh, some of the unions particularly. They're, they're very uh, good plans for many people, particularly shorter term employees mm -hmm. have a bigger advantage by going with the defined contribution program. In fact, in one of the hearings we had in the Senate on pension uh, programs. We had the uh, TIAA CREF people, which are the, the, the organization that manages most of the university employees, for example. Yes. And if university employees in Pennsylvania are given an option between PSERS, which is the regular school retirement program that all the public school people are in, or the defined contribution program run by TIA CREF, 80% of those people choose the defined contribution program. And I would assume, that, I would assume that portability is, portability is, is the big issue. That. In fact, when we met with, uh, there were three legislators that met with one of the foremost uh, public pension experts in the country that works for the Wharton School at Penn. Mm -hmm. And she told us something that I had never thought about, about how discriminatory the defined benefit programs that we have in place today in Pennsylvania are against women. Mm. Because they're geared for long-term 
employees that work at one position for a very long period Continuous of time. Continuous service. Continuous service. When we have, today's generation doesn't do that for, for lots of reasons. They come and go in different work uh, scenarios and that's, that's what the trend is now and that's probably gonna continue to, to work that way. But the people that are in and out of the workforce entirely are young women of childbearing years mm -hmm. that work and then have children, spend some time at home with them, maybe come back into the workplace, maybe change jobs at that point and go into the private sector or maybe come back into the public sector. Those people don't have the benefit of the earnings that they would have had uh, if they were in a defined contribution program. They lose that. They in fact, if they're not vested at the time, yes. then they get very little for the money they've put back for a period of years. So this has a, has, has a, um, a different vesting program. It's 25% in four years, 50% in six years. 75% in eight years and fully vested in 10. So even if you're only there for five or six years uh, under the, the current uh, law, you would, get, you would not be vested and you would not get the benefit of, of the earnings that you should have. Under this, you would get um, you know, a significant portion of those earnings in employer contributions. You wouldn't get any employer contributions if you left the current plan. Well, and, and Senator, when you and I are here talking about these things, it sounds as though a reasonable discussion can be had. Right. Is it possible to have a reasonable discussion on these things over in the General Assembly in, with, with, with the respective stakeholders? Well, we... we um, I hope so. We, well, it, it is to a degree. We did have one Democrat vote with us uh, at the Finance Committee on this bill. And it was a former township commissioner in a first-class township okay. who had gone through a lot of issues with... Um, these 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 same problems in his township and, and understood firsthand what they what they bring to the table how costly things are the, the the big the big issue is certainly the fact that the arbitrators can just make a decision uh, and uh, change the benefit program that that these these programs have to be removed from the collective bargaining process that just has to be an absolute in Pennsylvania now, I think I heard that the, the Auditor General, Eugene D. Pasquale, has also been um, involved in this issue. What, what role has he played? What has his contribution been? He, he's been very involved. He um, was former legislator, as you know, and uh, was in charge of a task force that, that, that uh, Governor Wolf um, is, uh, uh, sanctioned to do uh, a look at municipal pension problems. And he came back with a report just, just very recently with, with recommendations in it, uh, including excluding this from collective bargaining issues and, and coming up with some other things that the municipalities would be held more responsible to make sure their payments are made, some things like that. Most of it is very uh, reasonable, legitimate issues. Uh, the municipalities, to my knowledge, have agreed to virtually everything that has been proposed. The, the governor would like to see a, 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 the, the plans combined and uh, the Auditor General doesn't think that will work, and neither do I, and neither do the municipalities. There's a lot of issues with trying to combine all these different individual plans because there's different benefits and there's different funding levels. So we would have two major issues to work through, um, and, and that would be difficult to do to make it fair and equitable across the board. But Eugene D. Pasquale has been um, a, a very good resource for everybody involved and very supportive and willing to work with people. And, and as you and I know, politically speaking, he's a Democrat. Uh, it's been tough for us to get Democrats involved, even though virtually almost all the mayors in Pennsylvania are Democrats. They've been begging legislators to help them with this problem. And up until recently, we've had just Republican legislators helping them with this problem. So now we're, we're uh, broadening that, and uh, we hope Governor Wolf will be um, agreeable to some of the changes we're looking at. I've heard... Uh, different situations described, and um, the one being the city of Reading, that Reading can't afford to field a full complement of police officers because the costs associated with with benefits is is too expensive, and so public safety itself is being sacrificed. That's yeah. just that's that's unacceptable. Well, it, that and that is a key point in this whole discussion. Um, I have asked the FOP and the firefighters for years to get me numbers <clears throat> of, of what, the, what the people are that are on the street today in Pennsylvania, over, like over the last 10 years. Where were you? Where are you today? They have not, never given me those numbers because I, I'm sure that those numbers have greatly um, 
uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the cost to have these people operating. And, and their pension benefits are a big part of that. So um, we have a public safety issue with the citizens of Pennsylvania that I think is incumbent upon the, the General Assembly to address. I mean, we have that responsibility to make sure that our laws are not uh, harmful in any way to the people out there. And when I see 100 officers in a, in a third-class city now down to maybe 74 or something like that yeah, over the last wrong. 10, 15 years, it, it, crime is not, you know, getting any easier. Uh, right. We have a lot of violent crime. We have a lot of drug-related crime. We have a lot of problems in our communities. And we have fewer people on the street taking care of that. We have we have fewer paid fire departments today than we did. I mean, all those things have changed, and it's directly related to cost. So that's not good for Pennsylvania. We have to make we have to pay these people fairly, but we don't have to give away yeah. um, the, the you know our entire budget because yeah. um, cities like Scranton that will probably never, ever be able to weigh to work themselves out of the jam that they're in. And that was an arbitration award that largely was responsible for the, the final nail in the coffin in the city of Scranton. Well, and the, I think there's also concern that isn't widely appreciated. What would happen if we would have, uh, if Pennsylvania would experience a series of municipal bankruptcies mm. driven by these uh, these employee benefits that can no longer be afforded. I mean, at that point, doesn't that fall in the lap of the General Assembly? Well, um, it, it gets pretty dicey to see how that would work out in Pennsylvania, but the unions desperately do not want to see that happen because, as I understand it, the federal bankruptcy court could make settlements on all sorts of things for pennies on the dollar. Um, so... If if things get to that point, and and we are very close to having things get to that point, um, with with general fund budgets for municipalities as well as their their pension obligations, and they work together, but they're separate. But they but they 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 still have the um, the the obligation for, is is on those municipal taxpayers to make sure they have enough fun, funding for that. But we'll, we'll see what happens. But I would not be surprised if we see a municipal bankruptcy in the next in the next year in Pennsylvania. We, we have municipalities today that tell us they can't make payroll for the rest of the year. Good grief. Well, that's sort of a shocking uh, uh, situation to find ourselves in. And uh, anyway, well, Senator, I'm glad that you're on the case here and, and uh, working with your colleagues and hopefully uh, good sense will, will win the day. Um, where can folks go to learn more about you and your office and, and the things that you're doing? SenatorEichelberger.com is my website, and uh, from there um, you can have uh, access to contact us and, and see what we're doing. And, and uh, I post a blog on there every day and a lot of Wonderful. the issues we cover. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you do, Senator. Thank Thanks you. for taking time to be on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. And now, the final word on the public pension crisis from PMA's Chairman of the Board, Fred Anton. Uh, the subject of today's show is pensions, governmental pensions. Uh, governmental pensions, uh, pensions for state employees, uh, pensions for teachers employed by state government are in almost every jurisdiction in the United States underfunded uh, by a substantial amount. That means that the amount to pay the ultimate liabilities uh, over time, even after investment income or whatever funding has already been done, is inadequate. Pennsylvania is estimated to be between 50 and $60 billion underfunded. That's billion, that's not million. Now, uh, why is that? It's two reasons. One, the pensions have been too generous. Uh, two, the legislature on an annual basis has not appropriated sufficient funds to uh, meet the obligations that are necessary to fund the pensions. Uh, how can this uh, problem be solved? It can be solved by uh, changing 
pension benefits going forward for existing employees and for new employees. Uh, most private companies have uh, uh, pension plans going forward from some date in the past in the nature of a 401k. Now, a 401k has to do with uh, the uh, a company putting up a certain amount of fixed money for employees' pensions annually and the employee putting in a certain amount of money, which will give a total after 20 or 30 years sufficient to provide for retirement. The problem is that uh, it's controversial whether for existing governmental employees, uh, their pension uh, 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 benefits can be reduced. And there's been a recent article in the New York Times indicating what's going on state by state throughout the United States. And in many states where the legislature has been aggressive in reducing pension benefits for current employees going forward, there has been litigation and it's been alleged that it's a violation of their state contribution con constitutions. In Pennsylvania, the same thing would happen. If the pension benefits are reduced uh, for existing employees going forward, uh, then there will be litigation. Now the argument, one of the arguments uh, is that the legislature tremendously in increased pension benefits for current employees in 2002. And if they can increase in benefits, they should be able to decrease them. So what the, there need to be pension reform. Governor Wolf, when he vetoed the pension reform legislation, indicated pensions had to be changed. So we look forward to, in this present budget, that some deal will be made on pension reform. Well, Mr. Anton has that exactly right. The state public pension crisis must be addressed in this year's general fund budget. And when it comes to the public pension crisis at both the state and local levels, it poses the central question of our times. Will the public sector be required to live under the same economic realities as the rest of us? Well, PMA Perspective will be back in September. And until then, please visit us online at pamanufacturers.org to stay current on everything that's happening in Harrisburg. From everyone here at PMA, thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.